Well, good morning and Happy New Year. First Sunday in the year. Hopefully you've noticed we've done a little bit of a rebrand. Uh, this YouTube channel is now under the name Ark Mission. And that's because of a word that God gave us prophetically. That if we as a community would build an ark, that he would send a flood. Like not a flood that drowns people, but the kind of flood we read about in Acts chapter 2. A flood of his manifest, experienced presence. The presence of his Holy Spirit. Like not just as an idea, but the tangible experience of God in your business life, home life, church life, every area of our lives. But here's the thing. That kind of like demonstrable, impactful kind of God showing up doesn't just happen. Like that's the whole this word about build an ark, I'll send a flood. It doesn't just happen. Whenever you read about that in church history, where God has moved in a town or a city or a nation, always, without exception, there have been a group of people like cultivating this expectation that God comes and moves in on. Like, like 120 in the upper room that day and night are thinking about what God has promised them and praying it in. Like if you've heard about 1904 revival, like, you know, farmers falling on their knees in the fields under the impact of the presence of God, weeping and not knowing why, you know, crazy stories of like people in pubs just completely converted in one moment. You know, spontaneously, like no one preaching. Uh, and, and Evan Roberts was like right at the, at the middle of that, like the, the kind of young man preaching in some of these areas. But 500,000 people became Christians in one year. The nation still littered in Wales with chapels from like the move of God in that one year. But that didn't just happen. In that environment, like the environment that Evan Roberts grew up in, there were stories being told of how God had moved in the 1850s and how they, they'd seen these prayer movements birthed and crazy things had happened and many people had become Christians. And those stories fed Evan Roberts' ears and he fed the people around him with those same stories and it created this expectation and God moved. 1907, uh, 1906, there's a guy called Frank Bartleman. He began to hear these stories about what God had done in the Welsh revival, study them with his friends, praying to them, and, and like write letters to Evan Roberts. And in 1910, with William Seymour, John G. Lake, Frank Bartleman, they saw a move of God in Azusa Street in Los Angeles. But it didn't just happen. Like for years, they've been meditating on these stories of how God moves in an area. And whenever God looks to move, he first looks for people who, who prepare the way, create this culture of stories of expectation. Like think of John the Baptist, the forerunner, you know, like he's like, prepare the way. There's one coming. Like, he's going to baptize you guys in fire and he's coming. And he's sharing these stories, this hope. And he's preparing the way for Jesus Christ to come. This is how God works. He looks for men and women that will cultivate this culture of expectation. Part of that's the songs we sing. Part of it's the stories we tell. Part of it's the way we pray. But it's this building of awareness of God moving. And I want us to learn today from the example of the Ark of the Covenant. All right, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. And we're going to read 1 to 5, actually, to understand something about the stories of God and how they work. Here we go. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense. This is the bit I want us to get. And the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which 
was a golden urn holding the manna, an Aaron staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Uh, well, I'm going to speak a little bit in detail about these things. All right, so you've got these three items inside this box. Now, I want you to understand something. This box, crazy things happened around the box. The glory of God landed on that box, broke out in the tabernacle in crazy ways, like fire falling from heaven. Uh, when Israel were on a journey, like into the place of destiny, the place of promise, there were various challenges they went through and the box brought the breakthrough. Like uh, River Jordan, they've got to cross over this river that's in full flood. How are we going to get across it? And they send the high priests over carrying this box. And guess what happens? The flood stops. The river is stopped so they can cross over into breakthrough because of this box. Uh, they get to a, a, an enemy city, Jericho. They're like, oh my gosh, this is like this mighty stronghold. What are we going to do? God tells them, carry the box. They carry the box seven times round. Guess what happens? The walls come tumbling down. One day, they're going into battle. The box get captured. It gets taken into an enemy temple. But guess what happens? Like the enemy demon gods, their statues start crumbling into pieces. Every one of their enemies start getting sick. The enemies become so terrified of that box, they send it back. That box end up at Obed-Edom's house. And in Obed-Edom's house, everything he has gets blessed because of the box. What's so special about the box? Here's what's special. And here's what I want us to understand. The box contains three items that are three stories about God. And this is massive. Okay, so the first story, the first object is this, uh, what is it? It's the, you've got three objects. You've got like the tablets of stone, Ten Commandments. You've got the jar of manna, the, the bread that God gave them in the desert. And you've got air and stuff like Without going into massive detail in those stories, one story represents God as lawgiver, as teacher. That's the, 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 the Ten Commandments. One of those stories, that's the bread. That's the story of how God provided for them in the desert. And one of those stories, it's the high priest rod that represents God's leadership. And these stories create consciousness awareness of who God is and every time they look at that box there's an awareness this is consciousness of God himself so no wonder like when they see that thing being carried there's an expectation God's gonna move when they're in right relationship with that God like that isn't true for the enemies of God right like the box doesn't bring blessing to everyone. It brings blessing for those who have honor and respect for the stories of that God. They're conscious of that God. It's, can you see? It's the stories creating consciousness and reverence of that God. All right. Let me give you a silly example right now. I'm going to tell you a different story entirely. I'm going to tell you the story of Masha's salads. Some of you know Masha from church, right? Have you ever tried Masha's salads? They're crazy. Like growing up for me, like salad was like a limp lettuce leaf and maybe a bit of tomato and cucumber. And if you're lucky, a little bit of vinegar on there or, or, or vinaigrette. Like that's about as sophisticated as it got until the day Masha brings salad. Now, in Masha's salad, you've got all kinds of leaves, like a little bit of crisp spinach, slightly bitter, but hidden under the spinach, there'll be fennel. And like suddenly, whoa, where's this aniseed flavor coming? And you can smell the aniseed somehow. And then like one more crunch of the salad, 
And I, there's something sweet in there. There's mango in the salad. I've never had mango in a salad before. And then one more turn of the salad and, oh my gosh, there's feta. There's this cheese that's like kicking off against the fennel with the mango. And it's all blending into this sweet, oh my, now there's prawn. In this same salad, there's prawn. And all of these flavors are going off in my mouth. Fennel and prawn and spinach and feta. And it's just somehow like a symphony. It's all harmonizing together in this beautiful mix of flavors. Now, if I told that story to you correctly, it will have had two effects. Effect number one is uh, you'll begin to imagine and almost taste the flavors. Like scientific research, apparently it shows that um, when someone describes a sensory experience to you, the same parts of your brain are triggered as if you were actually experiencing that experience. So like the, the, the parts of your brain responsible for the taste of aniseed or mango will be triggered as I'm describing those flavors to you. So that's the first effect. You hear the story, you enter into the experience. The second thing is, some of you are thinking like, I'm inviting Masha over with one of her salads. She come into my next dinner. Or I'm inviting me around to her place for dinner. It, it creates appetite for the thing you're describing. That's the purpose of the stories of God in the Bible. When we tell these stories, number one, they open a door for you to enter into the same experience of God. That's how testimony works. Like, because God's the same yesterday, today and forever. When you tell the stories, it creates a doorway for you to enter into the same experience. Second thing is it creates hunger. Like, I want that. That's what was going on with Frank Bartleman when he heard the stories of God moving in Wales. And then it happened in Azusa Street. Same way it happened in Wales. This is the power of the stories. Story connects you to God's glory. The way you tell the story. Like Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. It puts it like this. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, when you celebrate what Jesus has done, it has this prophetic impact because he's the same yesterday, today and forever. So when you're thinking about what he's done, it has this creative effect producing more of the glory of God in your life. Like here's a tangible example, right? Like so uh, about 20 years ago now, uh, Nicola and I had a car, Sea Reg Red Orion, that kept breaking down. Even on the motorway, we had to get out and push it. And we remembered a story by Yongi Cho about how when he needed a bike, God said to him, you've got to ask me specifically what kind of bike you want. And he said, well, I want an American bike and various details to it. And then shortly after that, he got given exactly that kind of bike. So we were driving while stopping, pushing the car, getting back in the car to Wales. And we were like, okay, God, like specifically, we ask you for a blue VW Golf uh, with a radio in it, a uh, tape player, uh, J Rich, and that it would cost a thousand pounds or less. Because that's how much money we had at that time. And we figured like maybe we might be able to get a car for that amount of money uh, back then. We arrive at Wales where we're staying. Someone looks at our clapped out, broken down car and they said, are you looking to buy a new car? We said, yes. They said, oh, that's great. I'm trying to sell a car for a missionary. I said, what car is it? They said, a blue j Reg VW Golf. How much do they want for it? Thousand pounds, like which was exactly our savings. Phenomenal. And that story, we retell that story every time we're in need. So like that car, the car that we bought, the VW Golf, eventually that got written off, long story around that. Uh, and we remembered how God provided for us. And so we said, God, this time we don't have any savings. 
Uh, but we'd like something different, a different make from the VW Golf, a different make from the Ford that we had before. We want something different. And we want a bigger engine this time, like a two liter engine. And uh, there were reasons behind that. And we want it to be red this time. And we don't mind what registration, we want it to be newer than the, the J Reg that we had. The same day that we needed a car, because we borrowed one, the same day we needed a car, we got given by a friend of Nikki she worked with a K Reg two liter engine red Mazda. And like, the story, as we bring them to mind, it's prophetic. The testimony of what Jesus has done prophesies him doing it again. Even as you're hearing these stories of specific prayer and answer provision, take it, meditate on it, experience it in your own life. The story makes us conscious of his glory and we begin to experience it in our own lives. But it's how we tell the stories. Like, I think part of the problem in the West is we're so whingy and moany that we're telling negative stories that set us up in faith, a culture, to experience more of the negative. How we tell the stories and the stories we tell ourselves create our future. Actually, if you look at the stories in that box, the Ark of the Tabernacle, in some ways, you can see them as really negative stories of rebellion, not as stories focused on God. Like when the law came, people rebelled against him and 3,000 people died in one day. Like when the, when the manna came, the context is they were whinging about God. Uh, when, the, when the Aaron staff, that story, if you go look it up, it's another story of rebellion. But guess what sits on top of those stories? In the Ark of the Covenant. Go read it. Hebrews 9 verse 5. The mercy seat. And so all of those stories of, of, of rebellion. Are being reframed. Through the mercy of God. Go look at Peter's retelling of the flood story. And see how God reframes that story. Through the lens of his mercy. And we need to learn. To see God in the midst of our most discouraging realities. Think about the two on the Emmaus Road. And they're telling stories of how Jesus has died and it's all death and it's all bad. They are miserable. And Jesus walks alongside him, the resurrected son of God, and retells their horror story with hope of resurrection. Explaining how these things had to be. And we need to learn to retell our stories with a revelation of what Jesus has been doing on our worst day. Even when we don't understand it. Like one of my favorite stories, uh, a guy, um, I can't remember his name actually, but an Olympic athlete being interviewed by Michael Parkinson. He was an Olympic runner, lost his legs in a car accident. And Parkinson says to him, you know, like you're famous for being an athlete, a runner, um, but you've lost your legs. You say you're a Christian, you believe in God. Do you think that's fair? Do you think that's right? And without missing the beat, this is how the guy tells his story. He says, no, I don't think it's right. But God's got eternity to make it right. <laughs> Can you see how he reframes the story? With a, a culture of hope and expectation of the goodness of God. Now, church, like, here's what we're going to do this year. To create this culture that can see God move on it. To see more of his miracles and more of his power. First Sunday of every single month, we're going to have a Thanksgiving service. And I want you to come loaded, 2 o'clock at Trinity, every single one of those services, with your stories of gratitude for what God is doing. Let's give thanks for what he is doing, for while we're waiting for what he's going to do. Church, this is going to be a year when we see God move because we've given thanks for what he's already doing. All right, I want you to take one minute right now and I want you to either think about, meditate on or share with someone around you one good thing you can give thanks to God for from 2021. Go for it.
All right, God bless you, church. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I pray that as a community, our eyes, ears, and memories would be open to the stories of what you're already doing, that we would have a culture of faith to see more of your power, more of your love, more of your miracles in all of our lives in 2022. In Jesus' name, you are the God of the resurrection. God bless you, church. It's going to be an amazing year. Have a good one.